This is One Up Network Radio, and you're listening to the One Up Yours podcast. I'm your host, Garnet Lee. Got my partner in crime, John Davis, in with me. I could be playing Oblivion right now. We may. Let's go. Both of us can go do that, right? Hey, we got a pretty good show lined up for you today. Uh, so in the first block, um, we're going to be talking about, like we usually do, what you've been playing. We're going to hit some uh, reader mail. We've got a little introduction of our new news guy, Mr. Luke Smith. And uh, he has a really cool story to tell us about his uh, trip here. In the second part of the story, we'll be talking about, will Microsoft do a handheld console? And... Uh, yeah, we've got plenty to say about that. And then in the final uh, segment, we'll be talking about some Nintendo news. So moving on, let's let our two uh, guests here introduce themselves. I'm Luke Smith from 1UP News. And I'm Darren Gladstone, uh, senior editor over at CGW. All right, so let's dive right in. Darren, what yes. you been playing, man? Okay, is it, is it, can, I, can we get the oblivion, the obvious oblivion stuff out of the way because everyone's not, playing that? We all want to talk about it. What do you mean obvious? We actually like the game. You don't like it? Oh, I love the game. I love the game. I just... I need a life. I gotta. I gotta pull out for five minutes. I've been like. I've been looting like a like a major. Like I have, there's a one man crime spree going on in my my world right now. You're living the medieval gangster life. That's how I roll, <laughs> <laughs> bitches. So you're playing something other than Oblivion. <laughs> I mean, you said you wanted to get it out of the way and get to the other stuff. What else are you? What else is there right now? Well, I, well, I'll tell you. Actually, I guess after going to GDC last week, I was really inspired to go back because I love checking out independent games. And the IGF competition over at GDC really inspired me this year. There's a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, I was a big fan of Darwinia. I got a chance to take a sneak peek at their new game, Defcon, which is coming out. Which is basically it's like uh, uh, global thermal nuclear war the for more games. Totally, it's I'm like playing Whopper, Whopper, man. Uh, let me see, Cell Factor. Did you guys check that one out when you were there? Basically, think uh, PsyOps first-person shooter. Okay, okay, that's kind of cool. U- using a geophysics, fully manipulate the environment, looked really cool. Uh, it was only a, a demo for now, but that looked pretty But stupid. what are you actually playing? Oblivion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh! oh. Uh, I'll just oh. his arm. <laughs> well, yeah, I just wanted to just, you know, throw, throw some props Look at me, out. look at my cred. I know all the independent <laughs> stuff. I'm playing Oblivion. Yeah, <laughs> well... Yeah, I had to at least get that out of the way. Like, I'm a really big fan <laughs> that, of That's how Darren rolls. Artists. He's always got to do the whole, yeah, I got some credibility, but yeah. I'm I have no I'm credibility right. whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm covering Jeez, it. Well, we got through that. We burned through that pretty quick. Uh, so, Luke, jump out in the fire. I'm not really playing much of anything because I uh, drove across the country the week that GDC was because I moved from Detroit to San Francisco to come to this job. So... The whole thing about the interesting story, it really the first part of the story is not that interesting because it's driving through states that start with the letter I. And there's no difference between Indiana, Illinois, or Iowa. It's the same state over and over with, like, <laughs> different interstate colors, like different street side colors. It's ridiculous. So I get to Nebraska, the grail of states. And my first night in Nebraska, I crash in Lincoln. And there's uh, it's all over the weather that there's some big snowstorm coming. And I'm thinking, of course, I'm from Michigan. I was born in northern Michigan, which is like the frozen tundra of the Midwest. You know snow. I know snow. Me and the Ford Contour know snow. <laughs> like, two-wheel drive up front. It's almost like there are chains on the tires. So I roll out of bed, and the lady at the counter's like, it's going to be dangerous out there, son. Be careful. And I was like, I'm from Michigan. So I, I think leave. you walked into some kind of weird movie now. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it was. So I, I'm driving on uh, I-80 West, leaving Lincoln, heading toward Kearney. And uh, the road gets really bad. Oh, yeah, the road to Kearney. The road to Kearney, yep. Totally. And so it, it starts to get a little bit snowy, and I'm on the phone, of course, because when you're driving through inclement weather, the best thing to do is to be on the cell phone. And I decide that I'm going to pull off. So just as I'm about to pull off the road, I'm like seven exits away. In front of me, there's a semi truck, and in between the semi and I is like another winter weather vehicle, the Mazda Protege. So it's a semi, a Mazda Protege, and the Ford Contour. The semi truck starts to jackknife under an overpass, and I and it's, it's of course it's all actually happening in slow motion because everyone's driving at 30 miles per hour. And the semi truck jackknifes the Mazda Protege for whatever reason swings the e brake so that his passenger side window comes out across, like his passenger side window comes to my frame of vision where where did the driver have? This a is wife? radio. I mean, we've had this problem sometimes before. This is radio. They don't see your hands maneuvering. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> So you're looking at the passenger of this car. The pass, they swerved totally the wrong way. Were they cute? No. Oh. no, no this is it's Nebraska. Oh yeah, okay. Oh. Corn fed. Yeah, so I so I have to navigate between the two cars. More so I hit the semi truck. So now I'm stuck in Minden, Nebraska for like the next 3 days, missing GDC, arriving at one up significantly late with a car that's like limping across the country the rest of the way. 
So now that you're here, what do you think of the city? Were the rumors true? Uh, it's The city's great. It's just a lot of uh, places to go. And it's the, the whole thing is like I haven't really got a chance to go out and look through a whole lot of the city because it's like work, stock Craigslist, and then uh, work. Yeah, it sounds pretty San Franciscan. Mm-hmm. I'll buy into that. Sure. So uh, what are you going to play then? What do you want to play that you're going to start into then? I'm actually going to play Oblivion. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I, a friend of mine. Clean sweep. A friend of mine, when he heard that I was driving across the country and wasn't going to be able to pick up the special edition, went and picked it up for me, and he's mailing it to the office here. So. Nice. 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 Do you have anything you want to add about the Oblivions? Uh, I'm playing Oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also playing Brain Age every morning. What are you up? What, what's your age down to? Twenty-seven. That's. It, I think nice. I read this morning that that's what Iwata's brain age is. Oh well, fantastic. So <laughs> I feel a little bit better. If only Milky were here to help us out with the. Uh, the uh, the DS is out on the kitchen counter, and every morning, me and my wife grab it and do the little five minute training thing. See, it and kills the test me. And I wasn't there. I was here typing all that stuff in, and I can't get my hands on one because everybody likes it. So that's that's definitely a hit for the Game Boy coming up. Or for the DS, DS yeah. properly name it. Definitely a hit because I can't pry one out of any of the editor's hands, and there's a ton of copies floating around this office. Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty good sign. Usually, if there's something floating around the office, we're all becoming vastly more intelligent than you now. Yeah, well, that was a big jump. The gap is wide. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my name's Doofus. <laughs> um, so, what do you want us to hit next? Day? You want us to get into some of that there reader mail? Because, so, first one we have here is from NMA. <laughs> God. We'll just leave that right there. That's what it says right here. Instead of the console wars, who do you think is winning the third party war? And in their opinion, it's Ubisoft. Define winning. Um, Coming out with more consistently good games. Is that yeah, so, let's, so I guess if you're going to say sales, th- there's EA and then there's everybody else. Mm-hmm. Right. So and I think a lot of times people just cruise right past EA because it's gotten so big. It's seen almost as that, that same plateau. But let's talk about quality because who cares about sales? Right. Sales, whatever. I mean, we don't have to worry about sales. We're we're gamers. In terms of quality, I think Ubisoft is definitely up there. Yeah, Ubisoft. I'd, I'd, I'd have to agree. They're consistently coming out with pretty good titles, and they're taking some chances that a lot of guys aren't doing. So, speaking of taking chances, what do you think about them buying the Fire Cry license and the Crytek engine? Well, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of ironic considering how you know the the, the, Cry, the you know the Crytek guys pretty much t- you know took off and bailed to EA to EA of all places, and um, it's going to be interesting to see what they can do with the engine. Yeah, so I guess. The engine itself is already starting to be behind the curve, wouldn't you say? That's, that's exactly it. I mean, like the the the, uh, the new the new engine being used for cri- for Crisis it looks amazing. It looks you, awesome. Yeah, it was like it was it was like one of the to- the big things people were talking about at GDC. So now they have this license for Far Cry, which was, I mean, as an IP, what do you think? I, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of my response, too. <laughs> well, well, I, it was nice, but I don't okay, think it, really made it, it didn't really make an impact, did it? Spoiler alert for Far Cry, the original. <clears throat> By the time you got to the end and the monkeys with rocket launcher arms... Mm-hmm. And really, monkeys with rocket launchers? Awesome. Yeah, I, didn't, but, I didn't play all the way through. I watched other people that were around me playing it, and I, I thought it looked nice. It did have a bit of Turok about it. A, a bit. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Uh, just a hint. Just a smidge. At least it wasn't Trespasser. This is true. Okay, so Ubi, who else is a player in that game space? Um, hmm. Well, with Oblivion, I guess we've got to say 2K. 2K does have a well, lot well, of lineup a, out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they got Bioshock, too. Yeah, and the Sid Meier stuff. And... Yeah, so they've got a bunch of stuff from, coming for Firaxis, who mm-hmm. they've rolled into the company. And the 2K see. sports line is pretty solid, usually. Mm-hmm. THQ's got a pretty pretty interesting title, uh, lineup coming up. I mean, obviously, the company heroes they could talk about, but in Titan Quest. Yeah, well, you know I'm loving the Titan oh, Quest. Oh, my gosh, man. I'm so in love, in love with that. With that. Yeah. So, yeah, we're definitely working on trying back, to get to that. Hmm? I want my copy back of that. There are way. four more copies in your office. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I guess we kind of decided there's EA, and then there's Ubi doing some great stuff. And EA has been taking more risks, and they say they want to take more risks. Well, if they want to take risks, to do it without 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 a you know a movie license. Let's try something right. like a fresh and original, please. Absolutely, we're all about that. Um, next up, so uh, next one's from Urban Nomad. Urban says, uh, which games, franchises, IPs do you want to see make a comeback on next gen systems? Bionic Commando. Word. Okay. Bionic awesome. Commando is like my first choice as far as games that I want to see return. You sort of had something similar to it with Ninja Five O. Like the game was the gameplay was pretty similar, but just a raw redux of Bionic Commando is something I would kill to see made. Um, I'd say Shadowrun on both the Genesis and the oh, SNES. Yeah. I love those games, and I'm, and I'm just a dork for the fastest series. So was that really as good as we all think it was, though? Maybe maybe I'm just looking at it with rose tinted glasses from the past, but uh-huh. I just love the idea behind it. I really like System Shock and. It, 
And is Bioshock really kind of picking up the mantle there? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different kind of vibe, though, right? Well, it's definitely it's it's, like a, it's an evolution of the vibe for sure. But I well, got if we're going to go if we're going to go down you know a little more obscure lanes, I would do almost anything to get the next chapter of Anachronox. I mean, yeah, you know what? That was a great. Oh, that, was, yeah. that was a fun game for the time. It was it was unfortunate timing though. Well, you know, it just took so long because they were using the Unreal. The, Unreal. Was, yeah, it was mm-hmm. Unreal the Unreal One engine and building that into a almost Final Fantasy style RPG. But boy, it was a good game. And I have taste for sort of Western RPGs again now and I'm remembering Ultima Underworld 2 really fondly. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice to go back to that wo- that world rather than... I mean, Ultima itself got a bit a bit stodgy. Um, <laughs> but the Underworld games really had something special about them. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm noticing a theme here. Like, it's like all of us were kind of like digging these like, you know, single-player RPGs. It, it, yeah. it seems like, you know, maybe like Oblivion and you know, hang, you're coming back out there pushing it to the forefront. Yeah. I think guys are really like Kind of looking to those again now and wanting to bring them back. Yeah, the pendulum, definitely. the pendulum should be swinging back in that direction. I think that it, we've seen sort of the evolution and like the explosion of MMOs. And now that pendulum of it's good to play with other people, maybe in terms of RPGs, is going to start swinging back to it's good to play by yourself. You know, actually, have you, have you guys checked out Age of Conan at all from Funcom? Oh, yeah, no. they, they got a really cool idea they're doing. Basically, it's a single player game for the first twenty levels. You create your hero. And then once you finish the single player game, you could take that character online into the same world. Wasn't Fantasy Star going to do that? There was some talk of that at one point as well. I don't know. I mean, it's a ni- it's a nice idea on paper. It sounds really annoying in like <laughs> practice, though. It really does sound a little bit odd. But well, it does sound cool on paper, so we'll be interested to see how that Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see how it plays out myself. But. With new consoles, especially a new PlayStation coming out, I started thinking about, like, cotton candy games. Whatever happened to Jet Moto? I would actually dig. Yeah, yeah, that was actually a good, good, good physics engine on that. Was, and yeah. Jet Moto One. I mean, okay, so I didn't. The, the kind of, I guess, nine eighty nine. It, it fell down with nine eighty nine, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Actually, you know, here another obscure one. I'll just throw out there really quick. Anyone here remember Rocket Jockey from Sega Soft? It, way too obscure. Okay, I'm all, I'm alone on that one. <laughs> yeah, look it up on MobyGames.com or something. It's actually pretty cool. It was like rocket racing and. I think he's making it up. I think he's totally making it up. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to... Yeah, we'll see you later. <laughs> All right, so our last question is from Vic Viper X 3 Are online rental services like Gamefly hurting the industry? I've been a Gamefly member since November of 2003, and I can tell you that my game purchases have dropped to less than half of what they were before Gamefly, and what are our thoughts on that? Do we think it's hurting? Hurting? No, no. I don't think it hurts it You're at all. It makes to play the, more games. Yeah, yeah, you get to play more games. I think that's the, the I, I think awesome. And those companies buy a lot of games yeah. that people then rent. I think right there's some interesting stuff right now about what's hurting the industry. There was an editorial this morning about how um, World of Warcraft is probably the most responsible because people are burning all their game time on that. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I got another question for Vic. Hey, Vic, if you were paying $30 for a game instead of 50 or 60 how many more would you be buying? Right. I mean, we've had this discussion a bunch of times, but you cannot really go mainstream I, at a $50 or $60 I price point. I dropped $70 on Oblivion. In fact, it was more than that with Amazon's ridiculous shipping charges. I think I spent $80 to get Holy to get Oblivion. Well, and you probably had to have it next day. I didn't. I didn't. I, I, got a, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. It, I turned didn't up, it turned up on the 28th. Okay, actually, let me ask. Did you get anything? Out, like, I know there's a coin and some kind of like... On a book and a DVD. A, do you get anything? Like, is the DVD worth it? Is the DVD is really good, actually. It's like a 40-minute documentary about yeah it's Ryan actually, was really digging on it it's focused on them um, preparing for E3 and like the demo oh, that they okay. showed there and it's like it's really cool and there's lots of different it's not just like one guy talking over game I mean it's like a, a really good quality documentary okay like behind the scenes stuff that's yeah. cool all right, so that sounds like a wrap-up for this week's Reader Mail. Don't forget to send us in your questions. Skip will get them forwarded to us, and we'll do them here. Coming up after the break, we're going to get into a Microsoft handheld. You're listening to the One Up Yours podcast on the One Up Radio Network. We know you have ears because you're listening to this show, but you also have eyes, and you might want to check out this little thing we like to call the One Up Show. You may have heard of it, you may not have heard of it, but if you have or haven't, you should check it out. It has its own space in our network as well. It's put on by Ryan O'Donnell and the rest of the fabulous video team here, so give us a watch, the One Up Show. All right, guys, we're going to talk about some uh, handheld Xbox Microsoft action because what could be better than a smartphone than an X-Boy? What the hell? (laughs) All right, how did this all get started? Um, 
Tell me about this guy. He's um, from the Mercury News, right? Dean Takahashi? Yeah. And he writes this whole thing, and, uh, oh, it's going to be the ex-boy. Came out from his book. Wow, surprise, he's promoting a book. What's your thoughts on the book there, Mr. Smith? <laughs> it's his second book, right? <laughs> the yeah. The second book, he's returning to that well of Microsoft Xbox bookie goodness. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's opening the Xbox again. That, uh, the second Xbox. Well, maybe he's opening the bottom of the box. And, uh, and you know what's popping out is an ex boy. Oh yes, an ex boy. It's like a, it's like a Russian doll. They All right, do one though, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, just I was, you know, just on the way to the bus today, I was just thinking, you know, like a PSP in one pocket, a DS in the other. Like I've got a back left pocket for an ex boy. If they could just stuff a little bit more portable gaming. You Wait, know? do you want them to do one? I couldn't care one way or the other, but I think they're going to. Yeah, I mean, I really don't. I don't. Sorry, Microsoft, I really don't give a shit if you make this thing or not. I mean, I hate to tell you that, but I've got handheld. DS does it right. PSP still trying to figure it out. Microsoft, if you're going to spend some money, invest in games for the 360 heavily. Take whatever dollars you're thinking of making some piece it's, of hardware with. It's a logical extension you know, of the whole sense. XNA thing, though. It's like it's like another platform that's easy to develop. I mean, you know, because they want to dominate. They want to own like they want to do in every market. So... It's the one, it's the gaping hole in their lineup right now. Yeah, I mean, if I were to make one, I would make it without an optical drive. That's for damn sure. Okay. Yeah, because digital data, yeah, be like an iPod. It's going to be all digital download. Okay. Um, yeah. All media. Plug it right into your Xbox 360, and you yeah, can like, download games into it. across Xbox One level of power, probably. Portable Geometry Wars. Yeah, oh, okay, baby. you can't argue with that. Suddenly you know what? They could, it. Suddenly, it doesn't sound so bad. If they really want to get in this market, they could just reband the Gizmondo. I bet they could pick that up. <laughs> they could pick that up pretty cheap. No. Slap well, a Windows logo it, on it. it. Well, it's actually, gonna, it's it wasn't Windows be logo. The, it was running off Windows CE. Oh, awesome. It's already there. <laughs> it's going to be the whole dig- Microsoft digital download thing that we talk about every other week. Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, so in his article, he actually brought that up. What did he call it? It was great. He said he, he referenced their music service because they're going to have a music service. Alexandria. That doesn't really roll off the tongue to me. Like, hey, did you get that new track uh, off of Alexandria? <laughs> like, it sounds like you're licking it off of a beautiful woman. <laughs> Dude, you cannot touch my girlfriend. Dude. Sorry. Actually, it suddenly doesn't sound that bad. When you put it that, <laughs> that should be the marketing plan. Alexandria like, is kind of a name for a hot girl. It's too, kind of I mean. kind of like a stripper, just like with, a, with, a, with a silhouette teams. with a music note, you know, yeah. like a licking spot. Ooh, kind of like know. A, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, one benefit. Uh, You're so gonna this fit is in his, just great, around here. <laughs> Luke already. He's like dovetailed right into the mix immediately. Anyone who can hang outside Milky's office and deal with the jams, dude. It was Journey. Like, what? What do you need to to restart the night at seven p.m. <laughs> journey, and then you know what we did after that? Wham. We did. Oh, it, we wham. were. Did, did you Bam. wake it up? We were a man last night. There you were. Every song needs woo woos. Yes. So you know, I don't know. So I'm I'm still not completely convinced about a handheld, because look, right now what I'd like is I, so I'm kind of torn because you carry. So we we're talking about phones earlier, and I think this kind of relates to the whole thing because cell phone games are keep pushing forward the cell phone technology mm-hmm. to the. I mean, Nokia tried the N gauge, but they've abandoned it, and even in abandoning it, they're basically saying that their hardware that they're putting out now in phones is basically capable of doing most of the games in that portable sense. Actually, I might have to catch on that one. They, 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 they're not abandoning it. They're kind of refining it. And as much as goofy as, as, as their strategy has been so far, they're actually coming out with another N-Gage. It actually doesn't look like total crap, and I wouldn't mind using. Right. So I guess why, I guess the better way to say it is they're bringing the N-Gage back into the phone fold to make it more of a phone that has right. that it's capability. Their, it's their gaming platform rather than a gaming phone. Exactly. It represents right. something different. Right, and, and in a phone now, I mean, I'm definitely interested in having a Windows 5 phone so that I could have all those other functionality. Is that closer maybe to what they want to do? Because I don't need another, I really don't need another handheld. I really don't. I don't need or necessarily want another handheld. And I mean, at the same time, like, my phone's like the phone that Zach Morris uses. Like, it's this giant, archaic, crusty cell phone. So I don't know I don't know how it's going to serve me either way. And that's not said with any hate, because Microsoft seems when they come into spaces like the Xbox want to com- com- compete on a technology-for-technology technology basis. So if they come in trying to, you know, make this unearthly badass portable handheld that's better than the PSP, that seems to me to ignore all the lessons that PSP's learned in its first year. Hmm. Well, I, I think that, I mean, while I, I, I really could care less one way or the other, as long as the applications are there that are interesting, I think that uh, there's no one perfect device for any one person. Okay. So, I mean, like, uh, John uses the Trio. I have a Sidekick 2. You know, right. Luke, you have, like, apparently a 
The Zach Morris. Yeah, you, yeah. What's the you, Zach Morris? You, 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 have, you call on radio stri- air strikes on this crank up phone or something? <laughs> yeah, well, Zach Morris and they'll say by the bell had this giant. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, that. Oh, and that's like, like, that's what my cell phone Dude. is. I just have this giant, you know, Nokia Chongo that I use. <laughs> but I don't have any interest in playing Halo on a handheld. You right. know, and first, I mean, the PSP proves that the more complicated and 3D the games get, the mm-hmm. less interested you are in playing them. I mean, yeah. on my trio, I play Bookworm. Yep. Yeah. And the most excited I've been about the PSP since Lumens is Loco Roco. Right. Okay, I I totally play Mega Man Powered Up. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, but that's the first thing for me. That's the first application. That's for the me, first game for the PSP where I've been like, well, is big time has- 3D games are not where the handheld space is. Exactly. All the all the, the games that I've been digging are like, let me see, Exit and uh like you, you know, the controls are a little wonky, but uh, Katamari is very colorful, very bright. So I still always skip the review for I went up on this, but Splinter Cell on the PSP absolutely drove me nuts because it's very nice that they can technically do it, but it has no business being on that console. Right, just doesn't work. Also, a really dark game on a game that has a really dark. Oh screen, my god, it's horrible. That's not fun. Yeah, it's so dark. And and so someone actually had asked, sent me a note asking if it had the voices of uh, Michael Ironside, and it does have. It does have all the voice work. It's amazing everything they crammed into that. That still doesn't make it a good game. And I think that's the lesson that Xbox better or Microsoft better pay attention to before they start coming into the space and thinking, oh, we'll make this incredibly awesome machine and everyone will want to have one because they won't care because they've already learned. You know what? I'd say if, if they made a device, they just let me download stuff from Xbox Live Arcade. Yeah, that, that would be, be cool. Would be if, cool. I could play, if I could play, if I could play, like, you know, if I can, like, join the Blast Club and just, like, you know, play that on a handheld or Geometry Wars or whatever else they have coming up. That, that that's would more be compelling. Cool. And maybe pull a page from the Nintendo book and, and have connectivity with the 360, use it as a controller or some mm-hmm. kind of interface with the with the game machine. That I could see. Yeah. And that would actually be something that the cost wouldn't be astronomical on. Oh, okay. sure, yeah. Connectivity, still the future of gaming. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we're going to be all interconnected, yo. Um, so I think we're uh, pretty much wrapped up on that. Anyone have any last parting shots on the uh, portable Xbox? Is there, is there a date for it yet? Yeah, yeah, out in 2007, whatever. I mean, I guess right. it depends on when they decide to announce it. Do you think they're going to show this thing at, at E3? No, nope. no. Absolutely not. No, they're still trying to get the hype up about it at 360. Yeah. And I, I still, I mean, back to what I originally said, I would much rather than see them focusing their intention on getting great software out. I really don't care what box I play on. I really don't care. I just want good games. And that's where, the, the, come on, the last part of Microsoft is soft, as in they're a software company. Let's see the software, guys. Let's put the same effort and attention into great games and the Microsoft Game Studios that you put into developing Vista. And I'm not a Microsoft hater. Now it's on a kind of a negative tear today. Have you He's a, I, yeah, like wrong side of the bed. <laughs> yeah, it was the satch, man. I'm telling you. Today's, today was the satch. That's like, what got it started. Last week we were kind of jolly. This, this week is... Arr, arr, arr. No, well, get off my lawn, jolly, kids. Like fatigue. Yeah little spent yeah this is angry don't <laughs> yeah, it was hangovers last week so today Please today smash. i started the whole day today with the mystical potato head groove thing and by the way since we've done that before that's what needs to be in guitar heroes i want to see i want to see satriani in guitar heroes surfing with the alien yeah no yeah. mystical potato head groove thing okay yeah, it's jams all right so uh we got one more piece coming up here after the break we'll be getting into some nintendo stuff and we'll catch you then you're listening to the one up yours podcast on the one up radio network If you like what you're listening to on the One Up Yours podcast, we also do other shows on the One Up Radio Network, including the recently started CGW podcast. You might want to check that out. It's run by CGW's own Mr. Jeff Green, and he is the authoritative source in the community for PC games info. So give it a listen and check it out. We're back for the uh, last half of the show here, or the final third of the show, I guess, really is what it is, isn't it? And we're going to hit into some uh, Revolution stuff, because IGN leaked some specs on the, uh, okay, I guess the buzzword now is GameCube 1.5, right, okay, ha, 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 ha. It's how silly is it even call it GameCube 1.5, because the Revolution isn't really about the hardware, so it seems silly to talk about the hardware, but okay, so let's throw it out there. What do you guys think of the specs? Um... <laughs> yeah. What you uh, said. Yeah. Um, well, why are we talking about the specs on the machine? Who well, cares? I think, well, I think everyone's expecting that to be a sort of baseline of power on this next gen, and you know, but ultimately, isn't it somewhat irrelevant? When it comes to Nintendo's games, I have to agree. I mean, it's, yeah. it seems like a lot of their stuff just kind of defies like worrying about the the highest end three D yeah. hardware. 
The revolution was never about the hardware. So making a big ta-da over the specs is just kind of crazy. Okay, so here's like here's like the comparison that that Skip put together for us. So the the Broadway CPU runs uh, what they say 729 megahertz. So right now the GameCube's at 485, but we all know like the uh, Xbox has the 733. What was a Celeron core, wasn't it? Is mm-hmm. a Celeron. I, th- I think so. Yeah, something like that. Pentium three class, right? You know, the thing is, like, just you know, not to, not to geek out too much here, but but you know, CPU speeds are always relative. I mean, like AMD processors run slow, run, run exactly. slower than Intel processors. So, I mean, that's kind of mm-hmm. so you have to know short instruction set, long instruction set, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And it's then, more, uh, I mean, it's more powerful than the GameCube. I think. I mean, isn't that's that the all that really part, matters? Yeah. And it's so even if it's just on a par with the Xbox, does anyone really have a problem with the Xbox right now? No, not really. I mean, I was just upstairs working on, uh, I was, I'm playing Dreamfall because I'm reviewing that, and I was thinking to myself, okay, it doesn't look like a 360 game, but it certainly doesn't look bad. It doesn't look bad by any stretch. It's not hurting my uh, immersion into the game world at all. So, People are still playing PS2 games, and it doesn't look that great today, you know, by, by most standards today. Yeah, I mean, people continue to play PS2 after the Xbox came out, and even games where you could say, oh, well, there's a definite jump in visual fidelity. It wasn't like you went, oh, well, okay, I'm throwing my PS2 away. Do we know if the revolution is HD? Um, no, we don't. That's one thing that still hasn't been talked about, really. We don't know whether it's going to be HD or not. I'm, I'm going to guess 480p as well. Yeah, I would think 480p would be a safe bet. That way, at least you're standard into like you know the baseline of the next generation of television screens we'll be watching. But, I mean, isn't it like you know HD is going to be kind of standard TV starting in, what, 2008 now or something yeah. like that? Or? Mm-hmm. I mean, so, I mean, like, within this next generation of consoles. So right. I mean, it kind of makes sense to at least have a baseline of 480p. I would think so. And, and some output, you know, some different connectivity options as far as what kind of output connectors there are on the back of it. I mean, I, I'm not... I, I guess what I started... I guess the lead I kind of closed down the conversation with because it seems like we all yeah, agree. Yeah, thanks, Garnet. Sorry. Yeah, that was a really productive yeah. segment. Well, that's, that's great. <laughs> thanks. Let's just listen to what Garnet thinks, shall we? <laughs> it's the Garnet Show. Hi. <laughs> that's another podcast that I have. <laughs> I broke no one really seems at to home. listen to it. I can't even get my wife to listen to it. I think Nintendo well, are doing more point. interesting things than talking about their hardware or not talking about their hardware. Exactly. I think the Iwata talking about the the price of games being under 50 bucks is a significant thing. Very much. Um, they've been saying a lot lately, and I've, it escapes me now. You have a list. What else did we say he was talking about? Um, actually, I don't the, have that list well, here. Software. I mean, just, just no party. That was that was it. And then, of course, the other quote that we have here was Mark Rain saying, "Well, you probably won't be seeing the Unreal Three engine on the Revolution." And I guess I would be saying, "Okay, so <laughs> I mean, I, you're going to get the Unreal Engine everywhere else, pretty much. Yeah, your pretty PC, much. 360, PS3. They're all going to be able to handle. So you're missing out on the Unreal Engine, okay. right? He says that, and somewhere Iwata's going exactly. Well, I don't know that thing. So I mean. I guess everyone hears the Unreal Engine and they think, okay, it's just going to be used for first-person shooters. It's, it's being used for a lot of other games, too. But it's also, I mean, it's the it's a benchmark now. I mean, it, we've seen what it can do, kind you know, yeah. kind of. And uh, I think if that's what people's perception of next-gen is, by Mark Rain saying that Revolution won't do it, it is changing people's perception of what that box can do. Do you think that Nintendo's going to miss people's perception or their possible perception of what ne- what next-gen is? Do you think... I, I think they're going to try really hard not to position that way I think it's definitely going to be more of a you know that cute little entertainment box as opposed to look at these gigantic immersive worlds I, I agree. the 64 was the last box that they really tried to position as a technical powerhouse right mm-hmm you know, certainly they weren't positioning the GameCube in that way no well, I think they realize their strength is in their unique software and yep. that's and they, they just keep playing that I'm angle. actually more interested as to what what it is that we're going to download all these old games onto I mean, they haven't said anything about storage. They haven't said, you know, it's just this box that's plugged in. Is it going to be... How's it going to work? Well, considering how anal they are about sec- DRM rights and security, yeah. I, I can only imagine it's going to be like maybe a hard drive in a totally locked box. We're going to stream them, essentially? Well, <laughs> It is possible. That, yeah. Maybe you have an account, and once you're logged in, it has record of what you've purchased, and when you want to play... Everything they're uploading is tiny. I mean, mm-hmm. right. you know, it, it'll fit on a memory stick on anything else, so... Or you wouldn't even... Yeah, or you could just have internal memory such that when you wanted to play Bomberman or whatever, you simply, you know, accessed Bomberman, and it streamed it back down to your machine, and you were ready to play again. There are plenty of uh, DR, um, d- digital download services that let you do that right now. Yeah. So I mean, it's speaking of Bomberman, but not speaking of Nintendo. <laughs> Sound Bomberman on Xbox Live. Yeah. Yeah. Rock and roll. It, was that confirmed? No, it wasn't. 
confirmed. They said that it was something that they were considering and something that certain people in the, the development team would like to work on, but that they were in no way, shape, or form working on it currently. They made they they said they were pretty clear. I think in the story that Patrick wrote that they were not they were not confirming that they were working on it, oh. but that they were like they wanted to. So, well, I guess they want to. That's good. Then. That's at least good that they yeah. recognize that that's something that people want. I would like that. Tell them. I would like that. I would like. I think they heard. I you know, listen. they listen. They monitor us through the through the software, right? <laughs> Calls back into Microsoft at night. I, so, regardless of what the specs are, I'm excited about the revolution. I've been excited about the revolution since the first time we geeked on the whole controller demonstration. First time I heard uh, Mark McDonald talking about you know messing with the thing, I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. So, I, you know, I'm definitely willing to jump into that one and, and see what they can do with it. I'm a big fan of Iwata right now. Because he's thinking just about things being fun. He's not trying to change the world with it, you know? Yeah, he, he gave a great speech at uh, GDC. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. He definitely it gave was, a lot of insight. It was what that crowd needed to hear in, in the sort of light of what Sony and Microsoft have been going on about lately. It's like, we just want to make experiences that are fun. It's inspirational when you hear it because you think, wow, this guy is in charge of something and he gets it. Yep. Yeah, but he was saying like what it, it, they put together the original Brain Age in what ninety days. Ninety or days, and part of the uh, the push was you don't have time to complain. <laughs> <laughs> so I like the part where he's talking about how the retailers had to you know be engaged and play it. Yeah, he made them play it for like fifteen minutes or something. Yeah, well, so they should be involved in it because they should get that what they're doing is supposed to be fun. That the whole thing is supposed to be fun. That you know having seven hundred thirty three megahertz processors with certain amount of memory is like you get bored with that stuff. I mean, there's certainly a place for it. There's certainly... I I am impressed by the technical aspects of games like Oblivion, which we've talked about quite a bit, or what the Unreal 3 engine can do, and I'm excited to see what those things can do, and I'm very happy that 360 and PS3 have it hammered down, so let Revolution not have Unreal 3 and let it do something cool. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Precisely. Exactly. <laughs> Indeed. And Again, he, Garnet summarizes our thoughts. <laughs> it's like he's patched in. Get out the of my head. <laughs> to our brains. Well, you guys have the after lunch uh, slowdowns here, huh? A little bit, yeah. All right. Well, so let me throw something else out here. So I read this. Uh, I read this uh, thing on. Where did I pull this from? I pulled this from the LA Times Entertainment News that. A majority of view, a, more, a majority of Americans feel that the government has no business regulating broadcast television. And the reason I pulled this story is because I think it's so funny in comparison to the out the public outcry that you know we hear about of getting the government to regulate our games for us. See, what it is is it's okay to watch people dying, but um, it's not okay to pull the trigger. Well, actually, the lesson I've learned is it's okay to pull the trigger, but God forbid you try to have sex with someone in a game. That's oh, that's crazy. true. Yeah, pulling the trigger is not so bad. It is the sex. Because apparently sex Isn't is that sex kind is of evil. The, the same thing? The sex? Pulling the, pull the trigger? Pulling the trigger? Ooh! Yeah, can I get a... Can we get the rim shot? <laughs> Listen, I'll add that. <laughs> See, so I think it's really funny is this was done by a group called the uh, TV Watch. Their survey found that 82% of those polled said they would prefer to see individuals exercising personal choice over what's on their television set than the government stepping in to, uh, to uh, regulate it. The quote these guys throw out there is that uh, we need to remove the fog of misinformation, hyperbole, and emotions that have been the calling card of a vocal minority pushing the government to become more involved in television regulation. Hello? How similar does that sound to the game business? Can we, can we just cut out that television part and put in video games? And Why even cut out television? We watch our games on television mm-hmm. i mean like right now it seems like like the, the way a lot of people like channels work around having like all the great shows are on fx you know the shield right. or rescue me or whatever they have no problems you know with curse words and nudity on the air well i mean so that the listeners go to cable even in the 10 o'clock hour we see plenty on the major networks i mean it's not like they hold back very much especially not like in the csi style crime dramas mm-hmm. i mean there's plenty of graphic violence in that yeah i was, I was pretty much scarred by seeing dennis friends naked in uh NYPD <laughs> blue mm-hmm. so and that was a but decade think, ago but you're right i, know, I was, not, I was it, still scarred it's, it's not so much it, the violence as it is the uh as, as it is the sex stuff that people get so upset about why is that though well, I don't that's know. A, I'm not American. Wow. <laughs> that's a great sociological <laughs> I statement. I don't understand your American ways. It's because we're all birthed by the Puritans who came yeah, over from was, England to escape those crazy Brits. Mm-hmm. You know, Wandering around with our shirts off. And we wanted to lock it all up and put <laughs> you it... You do that here sometimes. And our pants sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Only after well, a like couple right of now. pints. <laughs> well, you know, Friday afternoon. John, get those know. things back on. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right, so we'll... <laughs> that is a mic, right? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, uh, well, thank you for coming, Darren. We appreciate that. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, so... So that was my absurd news. And then the other part we have to touch on, I suppose, is this whole thing about the uh, UMDs fading off into the sunset. Is anyone actually surprised by that? Not I mean, in the I, least. I, I wonder if they actually talked to anybody when they said, oh, we're, we're going to so make... we're releasing another this. format. How do you feel about that? <laughs> yeah. Because early on, there was like, Hitcher sold 200,000 copies or whatever it was. And, then, and now suddenly Walmart's like, we're not selling them. No one's interested. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in, in the world of retail, if it's off Walmart shelves, that's the end of it. It's all over. I don't, I don't care about what you think about, oh, we're going to relaunch it or whatnot. If it's off the shelf at Walmart, then it's not going to be successful at retail. So how could it have been made successful? If, um, they, if, if, <sighs> if, if they were committed to driving the UMD format, how would they have made it successful? By including it as a pack-in when you purchase the regular DVD? Well, I, well, either that or maybe even at least offering you the opportunity to, even if it's a lower resolution, giving you a TV out, option somewhere on the PSP so that you can plug it into your TV and watch it. I still them. think it goes further than that as well. I think we don't need another damn format. I yeah. agree. You know, it's like, you know, every device I've got takes a different kind of memory card. You know, my phone uses SD cards. The PSP uses other things. There's DVDs, CD, and like another disc, another. Oh. Di- I just want one, one universal kind of media thing to put things on. Well, I think I think the idea of that kind of disappeared a long time ago. But you know, you a two gig car. I mean, how many how many gigs on a UMD? Two, roughly. I mean, it's it's, it's not going to be very long before they can put games out on a on a memory stick. Well, well, yeah, and I think they're talking about that now with yeah. the with the next uh, refresh. And there's already the, the download. I mean, it's you know, it's all coming down to eventually it's all going to be downloads. Oh, well, I agree. And actually, another another thing that could have helped it, uh, the PSP at least, if they actually remove. I mean, Sony is so DRM heavy that they got to basically go through, jump through five hoops if you want to transfer a file over. So I wound Starting up with yeah, people not got including the cable in the box. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Right. So I, so Benjamin Feingold, who's the president of Sony Pictures Home Entertainment, actually, he, he obviously, obviously they have a clue because uh, he says here that they, uh, one of the biggest drawbacks for moving watching device was its inability to connect the gadget to TV sets. And at CES two years ago, didn't they talk about having home players or at least that functionality built into some DVD players? Talking about it, but that was like... They never did it. No. No follow through. And then, here's the great quote. This is like the Dr. Obvious quote. I think a lot of people are ripping content and sticking it onto the device rather than purchasing. No. Really? Yeah, because I was going to buy five versions of uh, Lord of the Rings so I could like watch it on my home theater and then watch it again on my PSP. Yeah, we already talked about this two weeks ago. How yeah. cool was have it to see the you, eight meg card coming? Have any of you ever watched a movie on a PSP? I have once. The one that was packed in with it. Spider-Man? Spider-Man? At my desk at one of my old jobs. Okay. You, you, mean, it. you mean on UMD, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Same thing. Same thing. But from download... Tons of stuff, right? Well, I, I, yeah, I would rip DVDs all the time. Would, like, I would, I'd have to automate the process overnight just in order to get two movies onto memory cards. But mm-hmm. yeah, hmm, I'd be interested to see. You know, Logitech did those uh, speakers and like home theater, home theater setup where you could drop the PSP in, yeah. you know, amongst the speakers. I wonder if that was like remotely successful for them. I doubt it. Wait, you mean the, uh, the, 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 the two speaker portable deal thing? Or? Didn't they have like a, I remember seeing it, it like, like a trade show. It was like a cradle thing. Yeah, a cradle you, you dropped it into. Oh, okay. I don't think it's something else. But whenever I see anyone watching stuff on it, it's usually like a TV show or something that they've downloaded or mm-hmm. pulled a torrent and, you know, on the bus or on the ferry on the way to work, you, you see it. But it's never on a disc. So, but you know what's sad is it's myopia like uh, Sony gets over things like this that makes you worry about Blu-ray because here after all that, the guy says, well, we're hoping the format's going to be reinvigorated with next generation capability that may, may include living room or normal television playback. Hello? You already said that was what you needed in the first place, and they're so myopic, they're like, oh, we'll just relaunch it. No big deal. The quote from the article that really concerned me was there's a quote from a Universal executive, and I'm just going to paraphrase it because I know we're low on time, where it was something like, the UMD failed, and it's the worst idea Sony's had since Blu-ray, which is really troubling because if Hollywood, Hollywood looks at the UMD, essentially what they're saying is as a failure. How is this same Hollywood going to embrace Blu-ray when Blu-ray, and you said it a second ago that you weren't interested in new formats, is an entirely new format that Sony has to give, convince people to use? This is a conundrum that Sony sh- definitely needs to take to heart and definitely needs to consider. Well, I think it was kind of a, a neck-and-neck horse race uh, up until CES even. And then when I guess when they started announcing the prices of the units themselves, I mean, the average price for a HD DVD is going to be 500 and 
the what, what the heck is it? Probably be twice that for the for yeah, Blu-ray. Blu-ray's You're talking about players, play, right. well, the player, but, 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 but that's, again, that's, I mean, on the, I mean, there's the, there's the game stuff, which is a completely different argument. Is they can ship a game right. that's 25 gig, but on the movie side, I mean, on demand is already cutting into everything, and it's only mm-hmm. a matter of time before there's HD on demand. Then why do you need a disc to watch whatever movie you want? You don't. Well, you, you don't, but they're, they're still trying to milk that for as long as they can because, I mean, that, that's a huge revenue stream for those guys now. Right. I want to pick up on what Luke said about the public perception thing with Sony. I think he really hit on a, on a good thing there because it stretches back. They kind of have a string of these, we're going to take something and do our own proprietary twist on it, and they don't wind <laughs> up working out. It, well, it, it started with Betamax, right? Mm-hmm. But th- then they've beaten Memory Stick like a dead horse, but no one else has adopted that. And so if you have a camera, like Skip has this incredibly cool camera, but it's saddled with Memory Stick. So if you don't have a Memory Stick reader or a Sony laptop, then you're, you're very limited in getting your information off your camera and into wherever else you want to look at it. Mm, yeah. So Memory Stick, UMD, Beta... Yeah, for for Blu-ray for a brief period of time, I had a I had a I was I was like a big buyer into you know into the whole thing. I had a you know a Clie, I had you know a, a Sony camera. Forgot about the Clie, and you know I would just take the memory cards and swap them back and forth. But it's just you're right. They're on that, but at that point, other people were saying they were going to use memory stick. Wasn't Panasonic right. going to use yes, it? Yes, they and were. Other people were going to, and then SD came along. Mini SD came along, and everyone jumped on that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'm part of the problem they get stuck with is that Magic Gate stuff. They didn't want to share. They didn't want to share their, their rights management system. They didn't want to share, share their encryption, and so they cut themselves off from the market they, again. They do this every sing, uh, that's they, exactly every single time. They're so anal about their DRM stuff that they just lock it down themselves. And when they don't share it, everyone else just goes another direction. And correct me if I'm wrong. Blu-ray is still not locked down, right? No, isn't uh, that one of the things that was slowing it right, down? Well, allegedly, that, right. Yeah, that was the the reason for the big delay. Just a parallel, uh, like we talked about earlier with Microsoft learning lessons from the PSP, if Microsoft is indeed developing a handheld, I hope that Sony is learning lessons from their past experiences and new forays into mm-hmm. media as they're getting ready to launch Blu-ray. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. All right. Well, the producer man has rolled his finger at me, which means we're on the way out. And no, not that finger. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Skip does do a great job of keeping up with the message board, so he's, he's watching what you're doing, and we're, we're picking up your questions. We look forward to uh, hearing back from you there. Don't forget to check us on uh, iTunes and give us a little review if you like what you're hearing, or give us some feedback, and we'll work to improve it. And until next week, this is Garnet, and we're out. This has been One Up Yours, a production of the Ziff Davis Game Group and part of the One Up Network. One Up Yours is hosted by Garnet Lee and John Davison. Produced by Andrew Fister and Mike Ng, and is published every Friday afternoon via the iTunes Music Store and from its home at oneup.com. 